This is Orsi, official old guy at oldguytalkstome.com, a podcast dedicated to helping older guys create kick-ass lives for themselves and those that they love. It's for women, too. Each week, I bring you a special guest to help you create that life that you imagine for yourself and those that you love. We talk anti-aging medicine, personal growth, relationships, and sex, vices, and other topics that many don't want to talk about but need to. Just because you're getting older doesn't mean you have to be old. Also, if you want to know three ways to get laid more frequently without begging, go to oldguytalks.com and opt in. When you do, you're going to get my informative video on three simple things you can do to get laid more frequently without begging so you don't have to turn in your man card. And ladies, you may want your man to know these things because I think you'll like them too. Additionally, you'll be notified weekly when a new podcast episode is ready for you to consume. Periodically, I will share with you other stuff that will help you create that life that you want for yourself and those that are important to you. Don't want to miss anything? Be sure to subscribe, share, and review this podcast. This is Orse, the old guy from www.oldguytalks.com, here with his special guest, John Spinks, the author of Cult Escape. And uh, I will tell you that uh, in in, uh, in getting looking at the materials for this uh, conversation I'm having with John, uh, it was incredibly fascinating. It's an incredible story. Uh, in my opinion, there is a screenplay here. Uh, John, <laughs> very definitely. There's a, this, is, this has all the characteristics of a, of a uh, of a of a of a drama. It has the the the, the, the tragedy, the enslavement, the the realization, and and the escape, and then the the success that you finally have. Uh, so I, I think that that's very exciting. So John lives in England, and uh, and uh, he has a masters in life coaching and psychology. He's also a justice counselor and relationship coach. And uh, most for those of us in the States, uh, John, we're not going to understand what is a justice counselor. <coughs> well, uh, thanks for having me on, Forrest, August. Uh, the School of Justice Counselor, uh, it is where, um, where a crime has happened. And instead of going to court through all the process and the, all that takes, uh, then we, we go and see them and we um, find out what's happened and we get them to, the, the perpetrator and the victim together and we um, flash out the situation, put the cards on the table with a view to drawing the line under it to save the whole thing into court. Nine times out of ten it works, uh, people end up shaking hands, uh, they forgive each other, uh, it's, it's amazing and that's what uh, restorative justice happens. Okay, and uh, also, and we're going to talk about this at another time. But you also have a a, a product uh, or an information product that you put out called the Answer: uh, Literal Steps to Your Blissful Relationship, and uh, that's something that uh, uh, is 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 available now. But we'll be talking about it later. But I want to tell you, I want to focus on on uh, this whole concept of cults and and your story, your experience in cults, and, and what's happening. So, John, what is a cult, and how do you, how do you do identify if you are in one and uh, versus let's say an organization or, or or something that's fairly structured how what's the difference between cult what makes it a cult well um the english oxford dictionary starting with that defines a cult simply as a system of religious veneration and devotion directed towards a particular figure or object that is the basic definition of a cult um i've done research on this uh, on linkedin i've done questionnaires asking people generally what do you think a cult is and the public perception uh, is generally, and I wrote this down, it's, some, it's control where a leader controls a group of people with their religious beliefs. And so it's where there's control. Uh, and so it's, um, I've never met a cult that admits they're a cult. Uh, mm -hmm. Cult leaders uh, don't want to be called cults. Uh, and yet it's a system that controls people. And uh, a question I would ask, how much control is acceptable? Okay, so well, how how do cults control people? What uh, what what kind of strategies do they use to control people? What they do is they um, they have laws of which people have to obey, and uh, there's there's literally thousands of cults, uh, over five thousand in the US, over five hundred in the UK, and um, they're all different. 
and they normally have a leader or uh, usually a man and uh, through his uh, through his opinions and theories and theologies and so-called revelations he uh, devises laws to control people now what uh, most of them i would suspect are sincere so they're not doing it just simply to make money or for power they do it with a genuine belief so they're incredibly believable and uh, they uh, people are drawn to it and uh, they end up controlling people and if people don't obey their laws, the rules, there's consequences, uh, people will uh, suffer one way or another if they fail to uh, keep the laws that the court leaders put out. Okay, so what uh, what kind of tactics do they use to control? Like more specifically, you say they'll suffer the consequences. What uh, what tactics do they use to control people, to brainwash people? What how, how does that occur? Well, uh, personally, I was born into a religious cult, uh, mm -hmm. and so uh, I knew nothing else. I was reared up in it. To me, it was the norm, just like brushing your teeth. It was my lifestyle. But uh, when people adults and secular join cults, they are weaned into them gradually they're not told the full hit from the beginning uh, but as they get deeper and deeper into it they start to uh, feel uh, an obligation to to fit in to, to the pressure and the peer pressure and so uh, the laws then that they take on board and it, it, it's very psychological and um the court leaders they uh, that they change the laws, they, they evolve the law, uh, the, the, the laws evolve, which keeps everything moving, keeps the power going. And so um, people just get into it uh, gradually without realizing, and then eventually uh, they find that there's reasons why they can't leave. Mm -hmm. uh, what do they, they do? Uh, is it control your sleep, your eating, your time? Uh, on, on a, what, what would be, let's say, even let's say in, in, in the cult that you were uh, uh, in, what would be a typical what would be a typical day for 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 you as a, let's say maybe let's let's talk about maybe not necessarily because uh, you were born in there, but let's say at age seven through ten or somewhere in that in that range. What, what okay. would be a typical day? Well, well, and I, I believe that cults control to varying degrees. You've got the full spectrum. You get cults that control your life 100%, uh, even to the point whereby if they say it's time to commit suicide, then that's what they do. Uh, right down to 1% 1, 1 where they, where if you don't turn up for one of their meetings, you'll get frowned at. And so uh, the varying degrees of control. Uh, so um, the one I was in, um, your whole, I would say it was a 95% controlling cult. So uh, a whole life was taken up with it. So um, uh, what the length of your hair, the fact, well, a seven to ten year old uh, in school, you weren't allowed to um, go to religious education into school assembly. You couldn't eat with your school friends. You couldn't go and play in their houses. You um, had to attend eleven meetings a week, five on a Sunday. It was uh, just a norm. Um, this is for seven to ten year old. Um, you, you, you had to wear a certain uh, a white shirt on a Sunday, and. Um, there's a whole host of different rules and uh, laws that you had to abide by. You couldn't have television, couldn't have music, uh, radio, computers, mobile phones in those days. And so um, th there was laws that covered many, many aspects of your life. Okay. What uh, now? Was it your parents that joined the cult? My parents were born into it, and my grandparents. They were born into it, and so were my grandparents. Okay, so wow, so this is a generational thing. So when was yeah. the uh, uh, so the particular cult that you that you were basically raised in has been around for quite a while. What's the what's the history of that cult? I'm sure they made you learn that on hard. Uh, <laughs> I'm sure they made you learn that really, really uh, significantly. Yeah, uh, 1831. Um, the, the Plymouth Brethren had the first meeting in England, Plymouth, and and uh, J.N. Darby, who was a uh, a uh, Bible scholar from Ireland. He got dissatisfied with the Church of Ireland where he was a minister. He came to Plymouth, he started up uh, um, the Plymouth Brethren. Um, he started evangelizing in Europe. And when he came back in, uh, at one point in 1848, there had been, a, a, there had been his doctrine had been altered. And so he withdrew from everyone who disagreed with him. And his group became known as the Exclusive Brethren. So the Exclusive Brethren started 
you can call that in 1848 mm -hmm. and in 1966 I, I i was born into it okay um the so you're going along uh because for generations uh your parents your grandparents and and uh others were going around and, and saying okay this is the way to live this is the way I, I need to be this is what i need to do what was let, let me back up here a little bit. Did you have very much contact with the outside world or were you just pretty much completely shut off? No, we went to school. Uh, we had normal, well, they had normal jobs. Most jobs were self-employed. And so, you know, we went shopping, we, we, uh, we went out for the day, but we weren't allowed to eat with anybody who wasn't in our group. Uh, we okay. weren't allowed to have anyone in our house, couldn't go to their house, um, after, couldn't go to after school activities. And so, so because we went to 11 meetings a week, then we were spending all our social time you know, with members in the cult. Okay. What was, at what age and when did you, and what was that moment that was the first time that you realized this is not right? What, what, when was that time? What was, what was that time and, and uh, what was the evolution of that to your decision to escape and i want to talk in great detail about the, the, the escape later after after we talk about this so sure. <laughs> well my story isn't a usual one whereby um people find there's something wrong with respect something wrong with the court within they and they eventually find out that uh, it's something they don't want to be part of because it's wrong and their tipping point comes and they leave with myself um that didn't happen um i uh, from birth was reared up to believe it is the true church uh, the only one we, we had the truth we, we had the leader who was uh, the universal leader it's one of his titles and and so um when i when i got to 18 i saw uh, i had I'd been driving for a bit and i started to experience some of the wicked things in this world like uh, football matches and the cinema and uh, things of which we were forbidden to do and mm -hmm. and um, over the next four years uh, as i uh, started to realise these things weren't harming me, and they were uh, mutual uh, good things, normal. Uh, a, a desire for the bright lights of the city, you could say, started mm -hmm. to draw, started to attract me, and the boredom of eleven meetings a week started started to contrast the two. Mm -hmm. And um, and I, I became like a, a rope in a tug of war whereby I was being pulled one way increasingly by uh, the desires I had to, to explore the world and to uh, be myself and to find myself. But on the other side of the rope was my parents who I loved and uh, there was no way that I could leave them because I loved them and I knew that if I left, they once you leave or once they withdraw from you, that you may never see them again. Mm -hmm. And that's why it took me four years to uh, eventually to escape. Yeah. So during those four years, uh, was it? Uh, did you have to actually prepare psychologically to leave, or were you afraid that you would be uh, basically forcibly retained uh, in the cult? What, what, why? Why did it take four years to to make that decision to escape, or why? Why was the process lasting four years? But when some things uh, pass off you. Um, like it, like the, the lifestyle was a part of me, having been born into it. Um, the only people I really knew were and met with every single day of my life were, were my friends, people I trusted. Um, and then there was my family, and my, my brothers. And uh, I knew that to, to leave would be the end of that, the complete end. And um, I, I, when you've been brought up in something like that, psychologically, not not only the physical as I just described, but the doctrine and the indoctrination of, of their, their Bible interpretations. Um, many, many, many Bible verses stacked up uh, saying that if you were to leave, then terrible things would happen to you and uh, you might go to hell. And so there's a whole a whole mixture psychologically uh, uh, which made it, um, which tied it, which changed you really. To, to being there and then of course there was the unknown coming into a world which, which would be on your own completely not knowing anybody 
uh, and that will take you know, your comfort zone to say the least. And so all these things added up. And um, and so for the, for the four years, I, I was I was unhappy. And so when I when, when I came to the, the, the tipping point, um, which was on my twenty second birthday. I um, still believed that it was the right place on earth and the only right place where I should be. I, I didn't leave because I came to understand it was wrong. That was two years later, which is a, I'll tell you a bit, a, about a bit later. Okay. So I, I came to the end, I, I came to a realization on my 22nd birthday. I was in the bedroom, I looked out the window and I saw these two drunken people down below staggering and I thought they're having a good time and I'm not. And then I had this realization, like an epiphany moment, which was, in 10 years from now, I'm going to be 32. I was good at maths. And I'm going to spend another 10 years miserable unless I do something about it now. No one's going to do it for me. It's either I do it or I stay 10 years more miserable. And with that, I made a commitment. And I said, that's it. I'm 100% out of here. And from that moment, I, 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 it was like a peace came on me. And I, I purposed then, to, uh, I planned to... Um, get out by getting my own accommodation, by getting my phone line in from a business. And uh, it took me uh, three months to do that, to, okay. to set everything up. And then uh, came um, the, the, the terrible day where I came down in the morning, 7th of November, 1988. And I said to my parents that uh, I've done something wrong and so I'm going to leave. And they said, you don't have to, you know, you don't have to leave, stay here, don't, don't leave. And I said, oh, I've got to, I said, because he said, well, what he's done, I said, I've been with a woman. I made, I made that up because that's a, a sin which you should get excommunicated for. And so they said, no, don't go, don't go. And I made my mum cry, which was the first time I ever did that in my life. And um, that was absolutely devastated. But uh, I, I said, I'll be back in two weeks. <laughs> and um, that was just to try and comfort them a bit. And so uh, I left. And uh, it was the saddest day of my life, but uh, the greatest decision I've ever made, looking back. And so I, I still believe, even, uh, for the next two years, that it was still the right place. Uh, and to, to answer your question, uh, well, when did I begin to believe it was wrong? It was actually two years later. And that was when I'd met my brother, my older brother, who I hadn't seen for nine years, because he left as soon as he could when he was 16. He walked out uh, when he was legally able to. And uh, long story short, uh, I actually had a nine hour conversation with him and um, in the conversation uh, he, he, he told me, I, I, I told him about the, the, the system and how they were always changing the rules and the regulations and the, the laws, which they were. Uh, there was times when, where, when you could have pets, there was times uh, in the 1960s and before then you could eat with people, there was times when you could be, be in a trade union. Uh, there was many things that you could do, uh, and now you couldn't. There was times when you could live in a, a semi-detached or terraced house, and then it had to be semi, then it had to be detached. And um, my brother quoted a, a Bible verse, which is that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And as soon as he said that, I suddenly realised, I could see that, that the Christian brethren laws are not the same. They change. And my eyes, it's like my eyes were opened and I saw it, it, is, it is a cult. And I cried because I realised at that point I'm never going back. I can never go back now. And so, so if my parents never came out, uh, I wouldn't see them again. Yeah. Did you know that there are 76 additives that have been approved by the FDA that can be added to wines? You want a wine with shit in it that may not be good for you? Well, there is an option for wines. There are been produced naturally organically they've been tested that have no sugar and when they don't have any sugar that means that they're ketosis and intermittent fasting friendly these wines have been produced with a great deal of care on small farms and are available to you how do you get them find out by going to www.oldguytalks.com backslash dry farms dry farms all one word with an s and find out more. And with your initial order, you can get a bottle for one penny. That's right, a bottle for one penny. And they taste great. They taste great. Don't wait, don't hesitate, don't procrastinate. Get those wines now.
Yeah. That's uh, uh, absolutely, uh, that, that must be, uh, like, it's hard to imagine how gut-wrenching that would be because uh, cause you're you're there. Um, it was fortunate that you found your brother because uh, otherwise you'd be going through this on, on your own and not really sure uh, uh, what is going on. Um, let's talk about the uh, the fact and uh, the doctrine of separation and how mm. that's used uh, to, uh, in your particular situation, how it was used to, control your ability to interact with your with your family that you left behind. Mm. Well, Jay and Zarbi, um, he um, wrote a pamphlet in 1847, and uh, this is the core pillar of the exclusive brethren. And uh, if there's other cults uh, out there, uh, they may relate to this, not, not exactly the same words, but a lot of cults are based upon this. Uh, it was called separation from evil, God's principle of unity. And the doctrine simply means that to be in unity with God, according to whatever a cult or whatever leader says so, you have to, you have to separate yourself from what and how the current leader defines as evil. Mm-hmm. So, so um, over the years, the, the, the leader of, of the Exclusive Brethren would, would decide what was evil. And, uh, and so there was a time when uh, having pets uh, were wrong. And so uh, everybody had to get rid of the pets. There was a time when living in a house which had shared drains and joining walls became evil, and so people had to move house. Uh, there was a time when uh, a lot of these rules had changed over the years. So according to the, the leader or the man of God's um, uh, uh, choice and decision on what was evil, um, it, it defined uh, what we had, how the lifestyle had to be. And so uh, if anybody broke these rules and laws, then they would be separated from, meaning they would be excommunicated, withdrawn from, put out of fellowship. And it would mean that uh, those who stayed had to maintain separation from the people who had left. Mm-hmm. And uh, I've got a chapter in the book um, called Two Religious Cults Split Up Families, because they, they claim they don't. And uh, it, this is one of the most important points, because I think one of, one of the biggest factors of cults is that they separate families. Mm-hmm. And the thing is, it's legal. It is not illegal to have a cult. It is not illegal to start a cult, to control people, to separate the families, to put fear into them, to get them to sign over your house, your money, your will to them. It's not, it, it, is, it is perfectly legal to do so. And so, I mean, the, the campaign I'm running is to bring, bring awareness. And one of, the, one of the things that many people don't realise is that if they join cults, uh, they may be a cult that will separate the family, mm. and that and that that is something which is uh, probably one of the worst things I think I would say that happens. Sure. What have you have you seen your parents since you left that that day? My parents weren't allowed to to, to see me. Okay. Uh, so I didn't see them for many years. Uh, but um, to cut a long story short, um, about four years ago, my mother. Uh, developed um, Alzheimer's and uh, I had a phone call, I came out of the cinema and on my mobile phone was my dad's phone number and uh, I recognised the number and uh, I think he phoned me three times in 27 years then, by that point. And so I spoke to him and he said, uh, mum's gone into a care home. So I said, can I visit her? He said, yes. And uh, the reason was that because she was in a, under a neutral roof, which means that we, we couldn't go into that under their roof because they had, to, they had to be separate. But because you know she's in a neutral roof, I was able to go visit her. So I went with her. I went for the last three years of her life every week uh, to see mm-hmm. her, which was lovely. And uh, in fact, I gave her some health products, <laughs> uh-huh. which were recommended for Alzheimer's and vascular dementia. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, virgin coconut oil and serapeptase. But they can also that. And she she recovered massively to the point of I would say. 50 to 70 percent uh, compensamentous, and we had a wonderful last three years. And the dad was there in the care home, uh, maybe about 12 times over the three years. And uh, so we had a little little chat. Okay, wonderful. Is there a consequence to the the family members that are left behind when one person out of the family leaves a cult? The, do you mean the people who stay in? Who stay in? Yes. Are there rep- are there repercussions for them? Um, it, 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 it's extremely embarrassing for them uh, to have somebody of the family to leave. 
And uh, I, I wouldn't say though I wouldn't say they get punished in any way, but but, but it, it is a, a, a massive tragedy and a loss. And over the years, I saw families split. I saw tears. I saw wives whose husbands were separated from them. I saw children who who, who whose parents had left, and they were now staying with friends or family, and uh, they were separated from their uh, from their parents. And so, uh, when you say repercussions, no particular repercussions, but you know, great sorrow. That's a that's a, a very uh... It's a hard, very hard thing to do. Uh, you know, I think uh, it's uh, very challenging to, for something like that. Um, so, so let's get kind of fast forward here into the future, and let's talk about what. Let's say you have a family member uh, or a friend who's in a cult, mm -hmm. and it's not a it's it's not a good situation. Uh, I know that you're the uh, uh, the director of operations for uh, Cult Escape, and I just put up uh, your URL there for everyone to see. Uh, what can someone do to help that person uh, get out of that cult? And is it possible to help someone if they don't want to leave a cult? Because I imagine a lot, a lot of times people are, are, you know, for whatever reasons, have a, have uh, said, "Okay, oh, this is good." Just to say, uh, after cult, there's a dash. <laughs> there's a what? After cult, there's a dash between cult and escape. <laughs> oh, uh, cult dot escape. Okay. Cult dash escape. Oh, dash escape. Okay. Yeah. Let cult. me do that. Thank you. Sorry. Should. Okay. Let me. Okay. Yeah. To, to, to answer your question. <clears throat> um, I, I've got a younger brother who's in exclusive eleven still. He's married. He's got two children. Um, and once people get married, it's even harder to leave. Thank you, because if they were to leave, they could potentially lose their children, lose their wife or husband, uh, lose their in-laws, you know, lose the family and friends. And so, so uh, what, what can you do about them? Well. Nowadays, I believe in people's free will and choices, and I don't believe in control, and I don't believe in manipulating people. So if people want to stay in a cult, if people want to join a cult, they're, they're, they're free to. Um, <clears throat> but what I'm concerned about is that people uh, don't know the consequences of what can happen, uh, and they don't know the full facts, uh, or they don't know the bigger picture. and. Um, my desire is just to alert people, to warn them, and to um, create awareness of what happens in religious cults, a lot of religious cults, so that people can make a more informed decision before they either join one. Or if people are curious and they would like to leave uh, the cult they're in, that they can uh, find resources on the internet, uh, YouTube, uh, they can, there's many contacts, the, uh, phone numbers out there they can get in touch with. And my site, uh, cultscape.com, is just one of those uh, where there's resource, it's a resource to encourage people, to give them hope. Uh, there's stories on there, uh, videos and uh, testimonies, uh, whereby people can see that there is there are people who have left, that it is possible, uh, even though it seems impossible, it is possible to leave and have a normal life and have a better life. People don't have to stay because the thing that gets me the most is that there are people who want to leave the cult they're in right now. You know, uh, no matter what cult it is, uh, there are people who want to leave and they can't because they're trapped. Uh, they, they feel psychologically that there's no way because the, the doctrine they've been indoctrinated with uh, forbids them to leave. Mm -hmm. They may go to hell, a whole host of reasons. And then, of course, the, the thought of uh, leaving their families is just too, too much. And it's those people in particular uh, that, that are going through this at the moment. And it, took, it, it, it took me four years to go through this until I realised sure. that I had to take responsibility. Uh, I, uh, I had to take a leap of faith. And I, and I did. And uh, it was the best decision I made of my life. Yeah. It's, a, it's, a, it's amazing, especially since you were born into it and have so many generations of your family that were part of this particular cult that mm. that uh, you were actually uh, um, 
made it made a decision, made an active decision to to leave and, and move on, and um, uh, and had the courage to do so because I'm sure that that for every one person that leaves, there's probably a lot of people that have been left that are in one that would like to leave, but but, but are afraid and don't have the courage to do so. So does your does your does your organization offer resources for people that want to leave a, a cult? Yes, uh, well, there, there's uh, phone numbers, uh, for example, uh, where people uh, there's help uh, available. Uh, there's stories of people. Uh, when a common problem us humans have is that when we're going through something, we can tend to think we're the only one, uh, mm -hmm. and, and uh, to realise that there's people out there, and there are many, many people who have escaped their cult. And um, my personal story is just one story of many, and it can give people hope. And um, people who feel trapped, they don't need to. Uh, there, there is help, there are resources out there. And yes, so the website, cultscape.com, is a resource of itself uh, mm -hmm. to, to, to direct, to give people hope and to direct people to uh, further resources as well. Okay, all right. Well, John, it's a, it's a fascinating, uh, fascinating uh, uh, look into a world that many of us uh, are totally unfamiliar with, don't under, uh, only heard about it a little bit here and there. Uh, most of the time we, we hear about it when the, when you have uh, the, uh, the very uh, tragic events that occur where people die either from uh, uh, mass drinking of poison Kool-Aid to, to the, 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 the deaths at the Branch Davidian compound in, in Texas and, and other places. So um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a world that uh, you know is out there and I, one of the things that really struck me was the fact that, 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 that it was, you know, I was, most of the time people think about a cult as being somewhere out in the middle of nowhere in a, a very mm -hmm. desolate area. And uh, I think what, what kind of surprised me about this is, is the fact that the, these cults actually can exist inside a, a, a city or a town, uh, th that they don't necessarily have to be a compound locked off somewhere uh, out, you know, in the middle of nowhere. Absolutely. Um uh, the research has been done, and as I said before, there's over 5,000 cults in the US, over 500 in the UK. Mm -hmm. And uh, yes, the, the, many are small groups, they meet in houses. Uh, the the, the uh, exclusive bathroom that I was in, who have changed the name instantly uh, now, now, my experience is all related to uh, between 1966 and 1988. But they have their uh, buildings, and they meet in there, and uh, pe uh, many of them are secretive. You've never heard of them. I mean, have you heard of the exclusive bedroom before? No, no, yeah. never have. Sure. Never have. This is the first yeah. time. Well, as I say, there's hundreds, there's, there's literally thousands. And um, it, it, it's just making people aware of this so mm. that uh, they can be better informed. Uh, some cults recruit uh, and they uh, can entice people into joining. And sure. uh, and so it's just uh, one of the greatest tools is to make people aware so that they've got choices. Okay. All right. Well, John, I really appreciate you coming on on, uh, on oldguytalks.com and look forward to, to future time when we sit and talk about uh, your, uh, your, your, uh, the answer, literal steps to your blissful product. It would be a whole different, more of a upbeat program <laughs> than, than, uh, than this one was so, though uh, the fact that it has a that you have a happy ending uh, is sure. really make uh, leaves us on a, on a upbeat note so this is Oris the old guy from www.oldguytalks.com signing off uh, with his guest John Spinks remember it's all about creating a kick-ass life for yourself and those that you love. thanks for joining me on this podcast if you like what you heard and learned then be sure to do three things. One, subscribe so you don't miss the next episode. Two, share this with someone who may need to hear it also, and it may be your significant other. And three, review it. Give me a good review. If you didn't like it, give me a bad review. I don't care, just review me. And be sure to get my free video on three ways to get laid more frequently without begging. Opt in at oldguytalks.com. Don't be that guy that just takes in the information. Take action. Without action, you're not going to get the results you want.